Turn to Revelation chapter 9 as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. We're going to be there, uh, well actually we're going to do all of chapter 9 tonight, believe it or not. Tonight in chapter 9, you know, I wore this shirt, I was telling people earlier, I said, you know, you're going, wow, pastor looks kind of strange tonight, he doesn't have a Hawaiian shirt on, you know, as I normally wear a Hawaiian shirt, right? He's wearing plaid. Well, you think this is strange, guys? Wait until we study here and what we see in chapter 9. That is strange, man. There are some incredible things we're going to see in chapter 9, as John's vision shows us some really strange stuff. Extremely odd creatures that we're going to see. Things that aren't of this earth. I want to put, point that out right away. In chapter 9, we're going to see things that are not of this earth. They are supernatural, church. Supernatural. You know, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is, speaks a lot about supernatural events. Period. Supernatural. Supernatural figures. Supernatural beings. But real, not, not, not fake, they're just supernatural. What is the definition of supernatural? Of or being above or beyond what is natural, right? Of or being above, beyond what is natural, unexplainable by the natural law or phenomenon. Abnormal, right? It's just abnormal. You know, many people struggle with Jesus' revelation because things aren't normal. All right? Huh. Fact of the matter is, they're not normal. Normal to our perception, what we have seen, what we know as being normal, right? What is normal? Well, my wife says this. Normal is a setting on a washing machine. All right? Yeah, set it on normal, and that's, that's normal, that setting on the washing machine. What, you know, normal is only relevant, church, to our daily observation of what we call normal. Right? And so the fact of the matter is, we're going to see supernatural things. You know, man has always tried to place God in human terms. You know that? Always tried to bring God down to his level. Place God that way. Something that is supernatural in reality, our God, is a supernatural God. Right? And bring it into the natural realm of what we totally can understand. Making God normal, basically. Giving God human form, even. Right? Giving him human form. Human emotions, human personality, right? Making him just like us, making our supernatural God just like us, church. You know, even God's word speaks of God in human terms. Now, there's a reason God's word does that, it's so we can have an understanding of his character. So we can have this. In Genesis 1 27, it'll be on the screen. So God created man in his own image, it says. Well, hey, if he created him in his own image, God looks just like us. No, that's not what Genesis is saying there. Not at all. In the image of God, he created him. Male, female, he created them. God created us with a spirit that would worship, you see. That is the part that God created man with is that spirit, the soul that is able to worship. Your dog can't worship, I'm sorry. Your cat cannot worship. Your horse cannot worship. Your horse, all those don't have a soul. I was talking to somebody tonight, and I don't want to blow anybody's, you know, out of the water, but your dog doesn't go to heaven, all right? That's okay. There's going to be plenty of animals up in there. Just read in Isaiah, and it talks about all the animals that are going to be in heaven. It talks about the lion, lamb with the lamb, the serpent that's not going to touch the child, but not your dog. I'm sorry. So anyway, also, we like the Bible speaks of God as though he has eyes, right? Eyes, the eyes of God. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts is loyal to him. God's eyes, right? So he's basically like us. He has eyes. As the Bible says, as many people want to bring God into that picture, and then the hands of God, he also, we talk about the hands and the feet. Psalm 118, 16, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does uh, valiantly, it says there, the right hand. So
So is God just like us. Not at all, church. Not at all. God is spirit. God is spirit. In John 4, 24, it says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, that's the image of God God put in us, is that ability, that ability to literally worship God. God is not like us, but he relates to us so well. That's why God sent Jesus Christ upon this earth. So he could experience those things. God sent Jesus in human form, in the flesh, born of a virgin, doctrinal stuff, right? So as to relate. God came as a man in Hebrews 4, 14, and 15, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, thank goodness, passed down here. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, church. Isn't that the greatest thing? God sent Jesus to come down, to be a part of mankind, to also, but was in all points himself tempted as we are, yet without sin. We always have to understand that. Our Lord and Savior lived a life as a man without sin, church. He was sinless. But he can relate to us, right? So what we've read and will read in Revelation, guys, I want to really point this out. It is of God, you understand. It is of God, and it is supernatural in its sense. Not of our normality, not human. Many things in here, and you know, and I really respect a lot of pastors, and I've been taught in Revelation by different pastors, and, and I'm not slamming them at all, but I, I think sometimes they, they don't understand this is God, all right? Those things of God are amazing, guys. They're amazing, and they can be anything. We must try to view all through, I want to say these spiritual eyes, right? In other words, spiritual eyes. View Jesus' revelation as what it is, literally. And it seems pretty supernatural, and it is. It's not normal by any means. Well, let's pray, and we're going to get into chapter 9 tonight. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, as we study chapter 9, boy, you're going to show us some, some crazy stuff, Lord. But God, you know the thing is, we'll never see it. Because Jesus, we're with you. We have been raptured before this time, before this time comes upon the earth. Again, Lord, I ask that, that you give us the, just a heart for those who don't know you. That they will never see what John is going to show us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is, What is that? Right? What is that? And as we read here, you're going to see, What is that? What is it, really? In chapter 9, verse 1, Then, okay, we've, we've had the four angels sound their trumpets, and now we're at the fifth angel. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen, a star fallen from the heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. The fifth angel sounds, guys. Now, seven seals had taken place. We remember that. The seven seals. Then they're followed by the seven trumpets. And so this, is, this now is the fifth trumpet to sound. You know, the seven seals and the seven trumpets both have a strikingly similar picture in this. I'm going to tell you here. The first four seals and the first four trumpets on how they're pictured. The first four seals, the four horsemen, the tyranny, the war, the famine, the death, the judgment upon the earth. Okay, those first four. And then when we get into the first uh, four trumpets... Those also, we've seen what we see last week, ecological disaster, the plants, the water, the sky, things that happen upon the earth again. But then in the last three seals, what did we see in those last three seals when we were studying there? Focused on heaven, the cry of the martyrs, things that were going on up in heaven, okay? Those cry of the martyrs, the cosmic disturbances, you know, of the heavens and things. Heavenly prelude to those seven trumpets. Now then, in these last three trumpets, 
these last three trumpets, not speaking of things of heaven, it's going to lead us to speak of things of hell, church. You see how they're similar in that way? Literally, those things that are demonic forces is going to be speaking about here as this uh, fifth seal and into the sixth seal. Supernatural evil, guys. Supernatural demons. Demons from the pit of hell. Things that are far from normal. These spiritual demons. You know, we are warned by Paul that we fight a battle, a spiritual battle in this world today. You know, there is a spiritual realm that we do not see. It is here. Trust me, I have been to foreign nations. I've been in places where I have witnessed. I've witnessed possessed people. I've witnessed the evil, the oppression, literally demons, seeing demons. And Paul tells us about this in Ephesians 6, 12. It'll be on the screen. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, church, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, he says. We wrestle against this. You know, there are so many Christians, la-di-da-di-da, -da, it does not belong. Well, there's no such thing, you know. There is, there 100% is. I've seen it. I've taken part. I don't know what you call it. I guess you call it an exorcism. Two different times, not in this country. Satan has a different way of working in this country, by the way. He hides it in other things. He hides it in other things, and many times, I'm sorry to say, doctors give a pill to get you back in the box, you see. They don't have that in other countries. I literally have witnessed. I have been in this community, guys. I've been in people's homes where I feel spiritual oppression, evil. It is real. This spiritual host of wickedness is real. Darkness of this age. Now, we've been warned they exist, right, by Paul. Now we're actually going to see them. We're going to see them, and it's a different bunch of them, by the way. What is that, you know? What is that, we say? That ain't normal, that's for sure. Spiritual demons. Now, in verse 1, we're just still there. Don't go too fast on me, okay? We're going to get through chapter 9, trust me. In verse 1, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen. Past tense, guys. Fallen from the heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, it says. A star fallen from heaven. What is that? Who is that, right? The verb tense fallen, as I said, means it had already fallen. This had taken place already before the vision that John was receiving. And it said it went to him. So this isn't a real star. This isn't a, a real uh, you know, celestial star, an actual star. It's a being or a person of sort, we want to say. I'm going to say a being of some sort. And he's given the key to the bottomless pit, given the key. Now, some would like to place this being as Satan, right? Got the key to the bottomless pit, right? Oh, that's, that must have been Satan fallen. He's already fallen, that fallen angel. Not so, church. This is not Satan. Satan is not the master of hell. Do you understand that? Satan is not the master. He's not the ruler. Satan will become a victim of hell. He will be pit put into the fiery pit. The key is given to a being. For what purpose? Why? Why is it given? For God's purpose and God's timing that is going to take place as we see here in chapter 9. God's in control of this, you understand? That key was given to that one who had fallen. It was given to them. So it's for his time. So where is the bottomless Pit. Where's that bottomless pit? You know, many will say the center of the earth. Be honest with you, we really don't know. We don't know. There's a spiritual realm, like I say. You know, I always say Satan or his demons come to church every Sunday. You know why? To learn. To learn. You know, he's been doing it for thousands of years. You don't think Satan knows how to trip your trigger? What arrow to shoot at you? Just on a side note, 
If Satan keeps catching you in that same arrow, that same arrow he can stick you with, right? He'll keep shooting that arrow, church. He'll keep shooting that same arrow until you break that arrow, until you break that what's in your life that God's saying, get out of, my li- get out of your life until you break that. Satan just goes, hey, same arrow. Pa-ching, pa-ching. Got you again, you know. You got to break them. They got to be out of your life, all right? That was a side note. Anyway, so where is this bottomless pit? Like I say, we really don't know. But we know who resides there. That's the good part, right? We don't know where it's at, but in Jude 1.6, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, church. This judgment of the great day is the judgment upon mankind, upon those left upon the earth. These are reserved for God's judgment. We know who's down there. For God's timing, as God will use them, you see. God's in control in reality. Unfortunately, we see a lot of havoc. And we're going to read about a lot of havoc here. As we read and study, we want to keep it in proper, literal translation. Church, always use the literal translation first. Don't get over-spiritualized with something. Knowing that this is basically a supernatural event that we're going to be reading about. You know, Revelation 9.1, as we've just read that, a commentator says, is a good example of how the book of Revelation is sometimes wrongly spiritualized in its interpretation. He says, some commentators say that the star, that it's fallen, right, is the word of God. And the pit is the human nature. And the lesson is that if the gospel is rejected, horrors are unleashed. Where did they get that? Where did they get that? No, that's that's what not John is seeing here. Where did they get that? It's far from the plain, simple meaning. You know the term kiss, K-I-S-S? Keep it stupid, simple stupid. That's really what you need to do. Go with the original interpretation. In verse 2, we're going to move on. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, like a smoke of a great furnace. So the sun, the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. By the way, guys, these aren't your standard locusts, okay? We're going to see that really quick. These are demons, supernatural locusts. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We read about those, right? We've studied about those. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. You see, the authority is still from God. They're not given the authority to kill anybody, just to torment people for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. Men will literally seek death and they can't find it. They will desire to die and death uh, will flee from them, John writes here. Wow, that's crazy. So out of the smoke, it says in verse 3, out of the smoke, these locusts came upon the earth. What is that, man? I mean, think about it. What is that? Not natural locusts. They avoid plants. Anybody knows? Locust is a grasshopper, by the way. Many times in Arizona, we call a cicada a locust, those things that make so much noise in the cottonwood trees around my place. Like a horror movie or something when those things go off, man. But anyway, they're, the, they're basically the grasshopper, if you'd say. But these ones, they're not natural locusts because they avoid plants, and they attack men like scorpions. They're demonic beings, church. They come out of the bottomless pit, right? That's where they came from. Demonic hordes released, by the way, by God. Released. He gave that key over. Now, you know, 
Some suggest this, by the way, this is so silly. Not as some would suggest that these locusts are heretics and Muslims and Jesuits and monks and Protestants, you know. <laughs> Not as someone would say. But they're demonic beings literally set free upon the earth. In verse 4, it says there, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The 144,000. You guys remember studying that? That is not the Jehovah Witnesses, right? That's 144,000 virgin Jewish men. We read that. We studied that. Anybody ever ask you, who's the 144,000? You take them to the scripture. They are the Jewish virgin men. God put a seal on their foreheads. Are there others that are sealed on earth at this time? I don't know, but we do know that 144,000 are there. Much like Israel, guys, protected. These 144,000 will not be stung. They will not be touched. Uh, tortured at all, like Israel. In Egypt, when Pharaoh was holding the Israelites, right, that angel of death came over and they placed the blood, as they were told, the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost, out on their doors, and it was passed, they were passed over. That's where Passover comes from, right? These demons will pass over those ones who are sealed. Not going to touch them, man. Not going to come after them at all. In verse 5, it says, they're not given authority to kill men, you see. They're not given authority to only torture them, torture them. God is in control of these demons, church. You know, what is that? We're going to get a description of these things pretty soon, and I'll tell you, it's pretty crazy what they are. Well, I'll tell you what it is. What these really are are God's judgment upon man. That's what they are. In verse 6, it says there, In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will actually flee from them, it says. Death will escape these men. Wish to die. Literally pray to die. Want to die. Tortured by these scorpions. By the way, has anybody been stung by a scorpion? It's seldom fatal. You can be stung by a scorpion. Very, I don't think hardly anyone ever dies from a scorpion sting. So you see, these scorpion stings are seldom fatal. So they do not die. They will not die. You know, the idea for so many, and it's a sad thing. You know, and we see this happen in our world all the time. The idea of death being an escape from life. An escape some way, you know, from pain or, or something that's in your life, whatever it is. That death, if I just die, you know, if I just die, I'll be out of all this pain and all my troubles and everything. Guys, you understand that's a demonic deception of Satan. Oh, you just need to kill yourself. You just need to kill yourself. And when you kill yourself, there'll be no more pain, no more hurt. That is a demonic deception that's put in to men's minds and their thoughts. Satan's trick. It's Satan's trick. You know, for the unbeliever, death will bring no rest or peace. Do you understand that? For the non-Christian, the unbeliever, the one who's not washed by the blood, there is no pet peace there is no rest in death. It doesn't take away any troubles. There is eternal pain, as the Bible says. Eternal damnation, eternal aloneness. Man, I could get into it eternal, eternal, eternal. Literally, nothing good ever again. For the believer, though, for the believer, death, as Paul says, is, can actually be gained. You know, Paul was in prison when he wrote several of the epistles. And one of those epistles was to the Philippians, to the church in Philippi. And he wrote here, you know, I'm thinking that Paul was pretty low at the time, but he wrote some stuff that was amazing when you think about it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, it'll be on the screen. He says, for me to live is Christ, right? To live is Christ. I hope you're that way. Every day I live for Christ. 
And to die is actually gain. It's even better yet. That's what he says. And to die is actually gain. And if we can even halfway imagine the glory of heaven, yeah, it is. But, he says, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. You understand? For the Christian, we, we we're continue working for God, laboring for God, as long as it takes, right? Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell, Paul says. Oh, I know what he chose. Of course he chose. He says, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And amen, it is far better. We know that. But you know what? We have been given a time on this earth. We have been given a labor to do. And we're going to labor until that. Where there is no more. And God says, come on home, child. Well done, good and faithful servant. You, come on into the glory of your Lord, you know. Amen. You know, one has to wonder if man will even be able to take his own life. It escapes him, guys. It says, no. you got to wonder that. They have a desire to die. Death will flee from it, it says. Death will literally flee. They must endure the pain of God's wrath. I hope this is sinking deep. I hope it's really sinking deep. Because those you know who don't know Jesus, whether they're family members, friends, loved ones, whomever they are, even the lost one over there, you don't even know. You don't want this for them. They're going to endure this pain. God's wrath. Not the wrath of man. You know, the wrath of man that ain't nothing. We see what's going on in our country today and all these riots. Guys, do you understand? After the rapture of the church, that ain't nothing, man. That ain't. That's children's play out there, what they're doing. Oh, hell will break loose. There will be no restrainer, as the Bible says, the Spirit of God, which is, who does, where does it end well? Right here. Right here. God's Spirit will still be around. You know, God's Spirit is everywhere. The fact of the matter is, everything will break loose. And they'll endure it. Verse 7, let's move on. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. The shape of the locust. Now we get a description, guys, here. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. John has given us a description here, man. This is what he is seeing. They had uh, and they had breastplate, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. He's hearing it too. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. This was their job, basically. And they had a king over them, a king. The angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek, he has the name Apollon. One woe is past. You guys remember the end there of chapter 8? Woe, woe, woe. The angel said, well, here now, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these. Oh, man. After this woe, two more? Really? Wow. What is that? What are these? John describes his vision of supernatural demons. These things are wicked, church. They're wicked, and their power is to hurt men. These are not natural locusts by any means. They're not natural. I got an image here. It's going to go up on the screen. And this is a rendition of what somebody thought they could look like. Could you imagine? You see that poor guy down there? These huge locusts. I don't know. Well, they look like anything like that. They're wicked, though. They're not your regular locusts. No little grasshopper popping across your yard eating your, you know, tomato plant or something. But anyway, let's carry on. What are these things? Like I say, they're nat natural locusts. Why are they called such, though? You wonder that. Why are they called? See, locusts have been the agents of God's judgment throughout the Bible. You see the locusts mentioned. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Exodus chapter 10. And we see the locusts back there 
in Exodus. And this is when the, the Israelites were kept captive by Pharaoh. They were in prison in Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 3, I believe. Yeah, that's what it says right there. Don't listen to the man behind the curtain. Look at the screen. Anyway, in chapter 10, verse 3. And so Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Hebrews, How long will you refuse to, to humble yourself before me? Let my people go. Kept going. Let my people go. Some all, plagues that already happened upon Egypt and Pharaoh, that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go tomorrow, I will bring locusts into your territory. He says, these locusts, and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth. They shall eat the residue of what is, uh, they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail. The hail came in and destroyed all their crops, right? And they're going to eat that up. And they shall uh, eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. They shall fill your houses, the houses of your servants, and the houses of the Egyptians, which they, neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth. You ain't ever seen nothing like this, Pharaoh. This is coming. This is something God sent him. And, they, uh, and he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall a man be snared to us? Let this man go, that we can serve their Lord, that they can may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? I mean, it is getting destroyed by God's wrath upon them and his plagues. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are those ones who are going? Right? He just said, Well, which ones are you going to take? Not Turn them all loose, right? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old and with our sons and our daughters and with the flocks of our herds, we will go. For we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, the Lord had a better, uh, better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware, for evil is ahead of you. And not so. Go now. Who, uh, go now, you who are men and have served the Lord, for it is what you des desired, and they were driven out of the Pharaoh's presence. Now, he wasn't going to let them all go, right? So what happened? Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hands, Moses, brother, over the land of Egypt, for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and each eat every herb of the land, all that the hell is left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night, which in the morning the east wind brought the locusts, man. Here they come, right? Here they come. And the locusts went up over the land of the Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously there had been no such locusts as these, as they, nor shall there be such after them. No shall there be. Incredible amount of locusts coming. God used natural locusts here with Pharaoh, right? Those are regular locusts. They come in and just ate everything up. The ones we are seeing in Revelation, guys, are supernatural locusts. They are not your standard locusts. Are these in Revelation locusts at all in reality? Not really. You know, not a literal locust. Much worse than any locust, any grasshopper could ever be. In verse 11, going back to Revelation, and they, one reason they were not natural locusts, we're going to point it out, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. It says that these locusts in Revelation had a king over them, right? Actual locusts have no king over them, the ones in Pharaoh's time. Proverbs 10, uh, 30, 27. The locusts, it says, have no king. These have a king over them. Yet they all advance in ranks. So these aren't the standard locusts. You know, many have tried to give these locusts human understanding, right? They try to give it this human understanding. And I've actually heard it taught this way several times, okay? Well, this is John's vision. And, you know, he's seeing those things that, that are happening in the future that he doesn't quite understand, and he's going to call it out. And they say, well, those could be Apache helicopters, you know, making all this noise, and, you know, the Apache helicopter will have a face on the front and stuff. Guys, 
These are of God. These are supernatural. Nothing man has created but God allowed to be created, church. You remember when I told you last week we talked about the book of Jonah and Jonah was swallowed by a big fish? And of course, you know, the song with the kids is Jonah in the well, right? That's not what the Bible says. It says it was a big fish. Now, any educated person would know that if a whale would swallow you and you spent three days in the belly of a whale, you would be mush. You would be dissolved and you would be probably out the other end of the well by then, all right? No, God created a big fish for one purpose, one individual fish, to swallow Jonah and hold him in that belly. There wasn't a whale out there. There was probably never another fish like it. Why wouldn't God create these locusts, right? For the same thing. The demons of hell are given these bodies, guys. You understand those evil spirits that are in the bottomless pit? Just like we will get our heavenly bodies, they desire a body. And what does God give them? This ugly thing I showed you. I don't know if it looked like that. But he gave him these bodies. In verse 12, it says, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these. You know, John, uh, let's read on through 19. Then the sixth angel sounded. Here comes the sixth angel. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. We're going to get back to that. That great river Euphrates. These four angels, right? So the four angels who had been prepared, you see these four angels? Just like Jonah's big fish, how God prepared that, who had been prepared for the hour, the day, and the month, and the year, church. <laughs> right down probably to the second it says, we're released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. John says, I heard the number of them. And thus, I saw the horses in a vision. Those who sat on them had breastplate of fiery red, uh, hyacinth uh, blue. I don't even know what that color is. But anyway, it's some kind of blue. And a sulfur yellow. We know what that is. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. Here we go again, guys. Whoa, what are these things? What is that? By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke of the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. By the way, brimstone is always judgment, too, in God's word. For their power is their mouth and their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads with them. They do harm, John writes there. Wow. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. John hears this voice from the altar, guys. He hears this voice <clears throat> from the four horns of the altar. Up in heaven stood these four corners of the altar, and on the four corners were the four horns. By the way, horn represents power in the Bible. The horn is the power. The horn of an ox is the power. And these horns have the atoning blood applied on them, of the martyrs, of those who died. And the prayers of the saints went up. And in verse 14, we see, they say, release the four angels now. Now, these may or may not be, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, guys. They may or may not be those angels of Revelation 7-1, where we'd already been. The ones holding back the four winds, remember that? They hadn't really come into play yet, so these could be them. But the fact of the matter is they are prepared for this very moment, for this hour, this month, this day, this year. I'm going to write down to the second. They have been prepared for this time. God knows when this time's going to be. Jesus says, I come as a thief and a knife, and nobody knows. Oh, they got it prepared. It's going to happen, guys. They've been prepared for that. In verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom... Uh, Am I in the right thing? No, go back here. I'm in chapter 11 over there. 
There we go. Chap, uh, verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill now a third of mankind, guys. A third. I don't know what the population on earth is right now, but that's a bunch of people. A third of them are going to be killed. Wow. God's eternal clock when that will take place. In verse 14, I mentioned the great river Euphrates. It says there, the angels, they were connected to this great river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates is mentioned many times in the Bible, and it will be mentioned again in Revelation later on. But the fact of the matter is, this uh, river Euphrates, why? Because Euphrates was a landmark, guys, of ancient Babylon. It was a borderline between Israel and Babylon, Israel's land that was promised by God to Abram. In, in Genesis 15, if you want to turn there real quick, we're going to see that promise. By the way, that promise still is still for Israel. You understand that? Uh, God has never gone back on this covenant. This is what you call an unconditional covenant. Uh, Israel doesn't have control of this land now, but they will. They will again. In Genesis 15, verse 17. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Am I in the right? Yeah, that, that, I'm in the right place. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant now with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he lists all these different tribes in there. The great river Euphrates, like I say. Also, it is the boundary. That boundary, it was with Babylon also. Later on, it was the boundary of the great Roman Empire was the river Euphrates, okay? And we will see later on in, in Revelation where the Roman Empire rises again. Babylon rises again. We're going to be reading about that later on. But anyway, verse 16, so that's why Euphrates is mentioned there. In uh, verse 16, we see, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And he says, I heard the number. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them, and the breastplate of fiery red, and, and this Hyaketh and blue and sulfur and yellow and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone, guys. Wow, what is that, you know? This is a mighty army. 200 million. You know, there was one time when I believe China said they had an army of 200 million. Many questioned that, that there was truly an army of that. Now, obviously, 200 million people, no problem there. But what is that, this mighty army? This army is described, number one, as very weird and grotesque, right? Very weird and grotesque. What is those things? Is this an army of men? I don't think so, church. No. In literal translation, not at all. I don't think so. It's an army of demons. You know, is John's vision describing some modern mechanized army? You know, many people take it that way. Oh, this mechanized army. And John's, he's trying to describe it the best way he can. Why can't we just say, God has done this, man. This is what it is, literally. If John's vision describing 200 million demons, guys, that's what it is. 200 million demons coming upon the earth. A demonic army would line up also with the locusts we just read about, right? These locusts that are weird. Well, a demonic army would line right up in that. Supernatural. Supernatural by far. Whichever, a natural or supernatural, what's their job? They kill. They kill. They kill a third of the population of the earth. I believe personally, personally, this is me. Take it for what it is, you know. Quarter and 50 cents and buy you a coffee, something like that. Anyway, best interpretation is always literal, church. 
not over spiritualizing things. Some things we have to take into a spiritual realm, but you know, the fact of the matter is literal. This is God's supernatural judgment upon mankind. We will not be here. We'll be in heaven. Think about all those things in heaven. You know, we have no idea what heaven is like. It is going to be so amazing. You know, the words that are put here, it's beyond that. This is God's supernatural judgment. Demonic forces turned loose from the depths of hell. Seriously, from the depths of hell. Judgment, yes, right? One third of the population, but look at this again. Judgment, yes, but mercy. There are two thirds left of the population of the earth. Two thirds left to change the way. Two thirds left to repent and say, fall to their knees, forgive us. God's mercy is always shown. Verse 20, will they though? Will they repent? In verse 20, chapter 9, let's finish here to 21 also. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries or of their sexual immorality or of their thefts, it says. The rest will not repent. These other two-thirds, God has such mercy. They will not give it up, church. They will not give up those murders, those sorceries. By the way, sorceries, that's drugs. That's drugs. It comes from the Greek word pharmakia, which is our pharmacy, right? But these sorceries that he speaks about in the Bible is literally drugs. And then the sexual immorality, they won't give that up. And they won't give up the stealing, the theft. This list of sins is a striking accusation of our age today, is it not? Tell me about it. Is it not? Murder, sorcery, drugs, sexual immorality, thefts. Despite all this judgment, man's sin still reigns. Despite everything that's coming at him, why will they not repent? You know, you got to ask that. Why won't they? Well, you know what? They know no different. Church, they know no different, you see. There's no Christians now on the earth. There are none to speak to these men and women. There is no Christian to speak the truth of God. No Christians to answer the question of, what is that? Well, that's the cross. That's the cross that Jesus died upon, that you can have salvation and eternal life. They, there's no one to answer that question, you see. They know no different. What is that? How can I have that? You know, how can I have that like you? Guys, now is our time to show Jesus. You understand? This wor world is waxing worse and worse and worse all the time. To show salvation, to show hope to those out there. Before the question, what is that? Before that happens to them. I use this scripture all the time. We're going to end with this. 1 Peter 3, 15. Church, 3. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Know your Jesus. Know your God. Know him inside and out. Know his word. Know his love for you. Know your Jesus. Sanctify him in your own heart. It's a personal relationship. You don't get it through me. You don't get it through the church. You don't get it by, by you know, genuflecting and doing the sign of the cross, none of those things. You know you're Jesus. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and then always be ready to give a defense. Give an answer. That's what that means, to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you. And I hope there's a whole lot of hope in you because you know what? They need it right now. They need it out there. You got to answer that question. What is that when they answer it? When they ask that question, amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, God, that we would, Lord, we would be able to give that answer to each and every soul who says, what is that that you have? What is that that you speak of? Lord, give us the power of your spirit. 
that we could lead many to Christ within this community. In Jesus' name, amen.